Hello, everybody. Welcome to Harmony Baptist on a Sunday night. If you will, stand take your hymnal. Turn to page 97. Jesus saves. <laughs> oh, me. i got to go away from the mic sometimes. Jesus saves, 97. We have heard the joyful sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Spread the gladness all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Fire the news to every land. Climb the steeps and cross the waves. Onward tis our Lord's command. Jesus saves. Two, wafted on the rolling tide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, help to sinners far and wide, Jesus saves, Jesus saves, sing ye islands of the sea, echo back ye ocean cave, <clears throat> her shall sing, her jubilee. Saves, Jesus saves. Life's first. Give the wind a mighty voice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Let the nations now rejoice. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. Shout salvation full and free. Highest hill and deepest cave. This our song of victory, Jesus saves, Jesus saves. You may be seated, Brother Joel. It's good to be back in the house of God tonight. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, we want to say thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be in the house of God. And thank you, thank you Lord, for the good service we had this morning. Many that have come by my way and say that the Lord helped them through the message. Lord, how that has stirred my heart. And, God, how you've given, Lord, clarity on that as well. Father, thank you, Lord, to, for this place and for the opportunity to be back in the house of God. Thank you, Lord, for the freedom and the liberty that we have. We just pray, God, that you meet with us one more time. God, that's our desire, Lord. That's our, that's our whole purpose, our expectation, Lord, tonight is to have the presence of God in this place, helping us, guiding us, directing us tonight. And, Father, we need that now. Thank you, Lord, for saving our souls. Thank you, Lord, for the cross of Calvary and salvation so sure and sweet. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen and amen. You may be seated, a couple of announcements to give to you. Uh, we do want to remind you of a couple of things. Wednesday night is uh, Wednesday night fellowship, and uh, you make sure you bring your food and bring enough for your family plus one. And uh, my wife slipped up here and told me that if you've got some uh, uh, extra gift bags, not ones that have things in them, but just empty gift bags that you want to donate for this coming uh, Saturday Lakes Retreat. We'll take those on Wednesday night as well, and uh, that would be much appreciated. And then on Friday, there's going to be many people working this coming week, getting things ready for Saturday. Uh, so there'll be people here all day on Tuesday, all day on Wednesday, all day Thursday, all day Friday. But Friday night, we're going to do an impromptu prayer meeting here at the church for Saturday. And uh, say 6 o'clock, we're just going to have an old-fashioned prayer time around the altars praying about uh, Saturday's meeting for the ladies. Uh, many people have said they're bringing lost folks with that with them at that meeting, and I'm praying that God will use that as an opportunity to give them the gospel and they get gloriously saved. And so, uh, listen, that's what it's all about, is it not? It's about exalting the Savior. Everybody good tonight? Say amen. Praise the Lord. So we're going to do an impromptu prayer meeting uh, Friday night. If you want to come, it'll start at 6 o'clock. If not, pray for us. And uh, it's not mandatory or anything of that nature, but we would love to be around to get around the, the altars and pray and, and just uh, have a time of uh, seeking the Lord for this meeting. Amen. Those are the one now. Tables are ready to decorate. Okay, thank you very much. All right. And so that announcement, tables be ready for be decorated on Thursday and Friday and uh, start at 10 o'clock and be ready all, all the way through whatever time you need to stay here. So that'll be fine with us, all right? That's all the announcements. We do have business meeting tonight after the service, so we ask that you stick around and stay for that. And uh, it'll be very short, very quick, I promise you that. And we're looking forward to what God has done and will do for us, even in the matter of business. 
And so we're going to sing another song, do some fellowshipping, and then we'll come back together and take up an offering in just a few moments. What a wonderful change in my life has been wrought since Jesus came into my heart. I have lied in my soul for which long I had sought since Jesus came into my heart. Came into my heart since Jesus came into my heart. Floods of joy o'er my soul, like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into my heart. Number two, I have ceased from my wandering and going astray. Since Jesus came into my heart And my sins which were many are all washed away Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart Since Jesus came into my heart of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll since Jesus came into all right it's through the last amen number five I shall go there to dwell in that city I know since Jesus came into my heart and I'm happy so happy be as on where I go since Jesus came in. Let me hear you now in that sense. Since Jesus came into my heart, since Jesus came into my heart, floods of joy o'er my soul like the sea billows roll. Since Jesus came into my heart. Okay, let's fellowship. Amen. Amen.
Okay, when you find your places, take your stand and take your hymnal there and uh, turn to it's the offering song here. Ushers, get ready. This will be our offering song. Page 139 at Calvary. Let's do the first and the last verse. Years I spent in vanity and pride, caring not my Lord was crucified, knowing not it was for me he died on Calvary. Mercy there was great and grace was free. Pardon there was multiplied to me. There, my burden so found liberty I Calvary. Life's verse, oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span at Calvary. Mercy, there was great and grace was free. Pardon, there was multiplied to me. There, my burden so found liberty at Calvary. Thank you. It's good singing. You may be seated. Let's get Brother Richard Irwin, <laughs> if he will, to pray with all. Thank you, dear Lord. Yes, God. Yes. Hey, man. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> hey, let's get the kids tonight. Amen. Have your Bibles open to Psalm 26 tonight. Psalm 26 tonight. Sister Misi's going to sing for us, and then we'll go right into the preaching. And we're going to be a little bit early tonight going into the preaching, but that'll be okay. We'll be able to get finished with the business meeting as the Lord gives us liberty to do so. Amen. Psalm 26 is where you'll be at tonight. Psalm 26 tonight. Sister, sing for us.
Amen. Amen. Psalm 26 tonight. Psalm 26 tonight. Keep your Bibles open tonight. Psalm 26. Let's stand reading God's Word tonight. Psalm 26 tonight, verse number 8 tonight. The Bible says, Lord, I have loved the the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, whose hands is mischief and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity, Redeem me and be merciful unto me. My foot standeth in an even place, and the congregations will I bless the Lord. I want you to pay particular attention to verse number 8 tonight where David writes, he said, Lord, I love, I have loved the habitations of thy house, and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Father, we thank you, Lord, tonight. Father, how we need, Lord, that special touch. God, I'm in desperate need tonight of your mercy and your grace upon me, Lord, as I preach. And Father, I pray, Lord, tonight that, Father, that you'd fill this place with your presence and with your spirit. Thank you, Lord, for all that you've done, Lord, today and how you've met the needs, Lord, of our church. And God, how you've dealt with the people's hearts and their lives this morning. But, God, tonight we need a special touch. And, Lord, we need revival. And, Lord, we need help, Lord, tonight in this place. In this hour, God, tonight I pray, Lord, all things be for your glory and your honor. In Jesus' name I do pray, amen and amen. You may be seated tonight. In Psalm 26, we find that David is writing about the issue of the Lord's house. Tonight, I'm thankful for the church, amen. I'm thankful for the house of God tonight. I'm thankful for the inhabitation of that God has placed upon this place for our edification, for our need in coming in and finding help in this time. But I'm also very well aware that oftentimes when you start seeing people backslide and get away from God, the first thing you start slipping is their attention to the house of God. You begin to start seeing them back away from the things of the Lord. And the first thing they back away from... uh, is their attention and their attendance to the house of God. David is writing in Psalm 26 about a love that he has uh, for the habitation of God's house. As a matter of fact, we see that the song the chorus signs over in Psalm 84 and 1, uh, where the Bible says, How amiable uh, are thy tabernacles, O Lord of hosts! And how David was writing there that there's a love even for the tabernacles of God's place and God's presence. Tonight, I love the house of God. Tonight, church, say amen. I love being down at the house of God where God does something for His people. Amen. And when we speak about the house of God tonight, I don't believe David is writing in Psalm 26 as saying that he loves the building Uh, We have a fine building. I believe that's important tonight. I believe that it's necessary for us to have a fine building for the things that we do here at the church. And I believe David's not writing about the building. As good of a building that we have tonight, the building's done nothing for me and it's done nothing for you. These bricks have done absolutely nothing for you. Everybody with me so far? I promise you, if you'll stay with me, I'm making myself to a point tonight. Amen. Amen. These bricks have done nothing for us. This carpet has done absolutely nothing for you and I tonight. The pews you're sitting on has done nothing for your soul's salvation. The pews have not even helped me in my time of trouble, to be honest with you. Uh, The pews have done nothing for me. The chandeliers that hang up from the ceiling of this church tonight, they can't help us in our time of midnight hours and the darkness of our life and the circumstances thereof. Uh, All these things that I have listed tonight, the bricks and the carpet and the pews and the chandeliers, uh, they're all evidence of something bigger uh, and grander than just a building sitting here. This building sits here because it's a monument. uh, It's a remembrance. It is a a monumental aspect of remembering who we serve uh, and why we serve Him tonight. 
Tonight, the help is not in the brick and the mortars. The help tonight is not in the carpet and the pews. The help tonight is in whose house this is. Uh, and that's the God of heaven tonight. And I thank God for it tonight. Amen. And so many times we get our eyes off of what we're supposed to be focused on uh, and we put it on materialistic things uh, and things of temporal nature, uh, things that the Bible says that moth and rust will decay uh, and we forget about the spiritual issue of what this church stands for. And we have forgotten why this church stands. Forty-five years ago, this church was established here. And it wasn't established here to be a social club, and it wasn't established here to be a place to where you can come and just escape for a few days or a few hours. It's not a place of vacation. Uh, it's a place that has been placed here and set aside for the purpose uh, of honoring and exhorting and magnifying and glorifying uh, and doing all that we can to point men to a God that has helped us, uh, a God who is able to save, uh, a God who is able to help, uh, a God who is able to care. Uh, this building is not the, the help tonight. Uh, this building is not our care tonight. Uh, but it is a symbolic memorial uh, of the God that meets with us here tonight. Amen. Amen. And so many times we say that we love to go down to the house of God. And I've been guilty of saying that. I love church. Amen. Church is my life. Hallelujah. I bleed church. Amen. I'm telling you, I, I, I thrive on church. Uh, there's times where I get disappointed we can't have church 24 hours a day, 7 days a week. Amen. But my friend and I, when I say I love church, it's not the building that I love tonight. Uh, it's what David writes in Psalm 26 uh, when he said in verse number 8, uh, he said, Lord, I have loved uh, the habitation uh, of the house. It's what goes on inside the house of God uh, that David said he had fallen in love with. It's the things that goes on in Harmony Baptist Church uh, that we're to fall in love with. Uh, and my friend tonight, hallelujah, we ought to have more love uh, and more care uh, about what goes on inside the building that God has given us. Amen. But you mark her down, that one that has no love and no care for what goes on in the house is that one that will oftentimes slip very quickly into backslidden conditions. There's no question when Sunday morning comes up, it's church time. There's no question when Sunday night comes up, it's church time. There's no question that when Wednesday night prayer meeting Bible study comes up, it's church time. Then why is it a question in your life? Some of you look at me and say, well, you're the preacher. I don't have to be here either. Amen. I don't have to show up on Sunday morning. Amen. That's my choice to come here. Amen. I don't have to be back on Sunday night. That's my choice. Now, I understand there's consequences associated with not showing up, being the man of God. I understand those things. Y'all start looking for another one. But I want you to understand that the paycheck is not what keeps me coming back to the house of God. It's not the money that keeps us coming back. Listen, we have all of a sudden gotten this thing out of order tonight. We have forgotten why we come to the house of God. What is the purpose of us coming here? Why is it that David said that he loved the habitation of the Lord's house? Uh, what is it that was going on inside uh, of David's mind when he penned out the words uh, that I have fallen in love with the activities of the church? Uh, what is it that David was pinning out uh, when he said I have fallen in love uh, with the activities that's going on? on down where God is. I'll tell you what it is. Uh, he wasn't focused on the things that God was not doing. Uh, he was focused on the things God was doing uh, and how God had begun to meet with His people. Amen. I want to preach a little while on this subject, how to fall in love with the church all over again. How to fall in love with the church all over again. So many a times, my friend, we take church for granted. Here's what we have all of a sudden made church, Brother Will. We have made church a have-to. This is what we say. Well, I'm a Christian, thus I've got to go to church so that nobody thinks that I'm not a good Christian. 
we oftentimes associate church with commitment. Well, if I don't go to church, then there won't be nobody else. And I'm not picking on you, Sister Reba. There won't be nobody else to play that organ. Or there won't be nobody else to teach my Sunday school class. Or there won't be nobody else to preach. I've seen it too many times, Sister Mary. God raises up somebody else when we're not there. He doesn't need you and I tonight. He's got plenty of his own self. Amen. We've made it a commitment issue and we've made it a, 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 a decision that, hey, we've got to be a Christian, thus we've got to be associated with it. Listen, my friend, I don't go to church because that's the Christian thing to do tonight. I don't go to church because it's a commitment issue. I don't come to the house of God because it's a have to. I come to the house of God because I want to. Uh, there's something here that I'm expecting, amen. Uh, there's something here that I'm experienced, amen. Uh, there's something here that I need, uh, that when I come to the house of God, it's the only place I can find it, amen. Uh, and there's some things that I come down to the house of God, Brother Horner, that I'm expecting God to do for me, amen. I'm going to ask you a question. When you're loaded up in your car and you're headed down to the house of God tonight, did you come here expecting God to do something for you? Seriously, did you expect Him to do something? We've oftentimes come to the house of God with no expectation. It's become routine. It's become absolutely traditional. It's become a job. It's become a paycheck. It's become a ministry. And we have forgotten that we're expecting God to do something in our lives every single time we're to meet with Him in the house of God. We've made it a business instead of a ministry. We've taken away the expectation that we're expecting God to do something. Every time I mount the pulpit, let me tell you what your pastor expects. I'm begging God for another soul to walk the aisle. I expect that every Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, I expect somebody to get saved. Now, whether they do or not, that's up to God. But I'm expecting it to happen. Amen. I'm expecting for somebody to come down and say, Pastor, I sure am glad that the Lord has answered another prayer in my life uh, this week. Now, not oftentimes, sometimes that never comes across my ears, uh, but I'm expecting God to do something. There's some expectations that I've got down at the house of God. When I come down to the house of God, can I tell you what we ought to be expecting? We ought to be expecting to lift up our hands and worship and to adore the holy God that we serve. There's some expectations tonight. You expect when you come down to the house of God, we sing some hymns, do you not? If we ever get to contemporary music, you go ahead and pack up your bags. I'm coming with you. We'll find somewhere else to go. Not everybody said amen there. I'm expecting God to do something. I, you expect when you get down to the house of God, there'll be somebody to preach to you. That's your expectation. But can I say with that expectation, I want an experience also. I don't want just a hymn to be sung and a message to be preached. I, I want the very presence of God to fill this place. I, and I want God's presence to be so real uh, and so tangible down at the house of God uh, that I feel Him in my soul uh, and my bones burn uh, with the presence of a holy God uh, and the Jehovah God of the Bible uh, and how He meets my needs and helps me in those times of worship. Amen. I want that experience. I want something fresh and something new. David is writing unto us, and he said, Lord, how I have loved the habitation of thy house. Instead, we have failed to remember what the house of God is. And we've made it a byproduct of our lives. We don't care whether or not we miss church anymore. Everybody all right? I'm trying to help y'all. The devil's beating me up right now. Y'all help me. Pray for me, men. We don't have a care anymore about the house of God. You realize tonight there are men and women getting beheaded because they want to have something to do with God tonight. And yet all of a sudden our big toe starts hurting us and we can't get down to the house of God. 
God help us tonight. Hallelujah. I'm talking about David said, I love what goes on at the house of God so much that I think I'm going to pin it out. And I'm going to pin it out in such a way that whenever somebody reads it, they won't have an un- they won't have a confusing thought that I love the house of God so much that I wanted to put it in words. He said over there in the same book, book of Psalms, he said, I was glad when they said unto me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Amen. He said, I didn't find a way to get out of it. I got excited when they said, we were having meeting, amen. But nowadays, everybody's trying to find a reason why to shut down church. It's snowing in New York. Are we having church, preacher? No. We're not shutting down the house of God. Let's keep on. You want to know why? It's because this building represents something. It represents Christianity to the one that's driving by on 58 in Youngstown Road. Uh, when they see the steeple light on and the house of God lit up, uh, it's representing to them something uh, that there's somebody there uh, that believes in what they're going there for. Uh, they have a testimony of Christ. Uh, they have a testimony of God. Uh, but it also shows commitment, my friend, tonight. I'm a stickler about being in church every time the doors are open. You want to know why? What if that one person you've been inviting to come to church all of a sudden shows up on Wednesday night and you ain't here? What's that going to say to them? I've had that happen to me one time. I've been inviting a man over and over and over and over again, and it just so happened one Wednesday night when I took off, he showed up. And the next time I saw him, Brother Horner, he said, You wasn't even there. I said, I'm so sorry. He said, If it ain't that much important to you, it ain't going to be that much important to me. And that broke my heart. You want to know what that done to me? That showed me a commitment issue. We're committed to get up every Monday morning and go go to the workplace. We ought to be committed to come down to the house of God. Amen? That big toe all of a sudden gets healed up on Monday morning, does it not? I've been bit by the mean bug. I'm trying to help y'all. I'm talking about if we're ever going to see God do something in Harmony Baptist Church, there's got to be some commitment to what we're doing here tonight. There's got to be some commitment. I'm talking about every time we lay out of the house of God, this is what's beginning to happen. We're finding ourselves backsliding. You mark her down, every single person that will lay out on the house of God is a person whose life is wrecked, uh, whose life is struggling, uh, whose life is uh, tainted with sin and with a lifestyle that's ungodly and unrighteous. It's because they don't see an importance. uh, They don't see the necessity. uh, They don't see the commitment. uh, They don't have a love for the house of God anymore. Instead, uh, it's become routine to them and that's all they care about is fulfilling a requirement. The house of God is not a requirement. It's a privilege. I get to go to the house of God. I love to get to go to the house of God. I have a desire to go down to the house of God. You say, preacher, what in the world makes you love church so much? I'll tell you three things tonight by way of a topical message, and I don't ever hardly preach topically. I want to give you three things tonight that makes me love the house of God even more tonight. Number one tonight, I want you to understand what makes me love the habitation of the Lord's house tonight is that it's a place where the sovereign is praised. Amen. It's a time that we can come together and lift our hands. Uh, He said, lift your hands uh, in the congregation. Amen. Uh, It's a time of worship. Uh, It's a time of adoring. Uh, It's a time of praise. Uh, It's a time of glorifying uh, and magnifying the God of our salvation. Amen. I like it. Amen. I like it. Listen, the bricks can't do it for me, but I sure am glad I can do it among the bricks. Hallelujah. There's nothing gets me more excited than to hear people start worshiping. Worshiping. Lifting your hands. Listen, long before the Atlanta Braves were doing the tomahawk, Holy Ghost Baptists were lifting their hands and waving the preacher on. Amen. I'm talking about a worship. 
I love worship down at the house of God. What makes me love the habitation of God's house is that there's worship that goes on down there. People that are testifying. People that are lifting their hands. People that are singing. People that will mount the pulpit and preach. People that will climb up in the choir and begin to lift their voices in one accord in unison for the glory of God. Those things stir my heart. Those things excite me. Those things help me. Hallelujah. And I find them down at the house of God. You try to get some of your co-workers together to sing Amazing Grace and see if it works. You go by the post office tomorrow and get all them postal workers to come out there and have prayer meeting with you. It ain't going to work, is it? I dare you step up on one of them... uh, conveyor belts at the Walmart Supercenter and say, hey, we're going to have Bible prayer and Bible study and prayer meeting right now. By the way, Brother Carl Hatch has done that before before he died. He'd do that very regularly, by the way. They'd all probably arrest you and kick you out of the Walmart. But if you get down to the house of God where it's an expectation, if you get down to the house of God where it's a normal activity, You get down to the house of God where it's conducive for the glory of God to show up and the people of God to worship. And you say, let's have a prayer meeting. Everybody ought to have a desire to get around the altar and say, hallelujah. We get to reach into the very portals of glory by the way of prayer and meet with a God that is the God of the universe. Hallelujah. If you get down to the house of God and say, preacher, I want to testify, nobody's going to look at you strange. They may get excited. They may get pumped up. They may get get all of a sudden worked up themselves uh, and say, I want to brag on the Lord a little bit. Uh, that's why I love uh, the house of God. Amen. Brother Carl Hatch was notorious for doing those things. There's a story you can probably ask Brother Tony Hudson when he comes. Brother Tony Hudson and Brother Carl Hatch was down at an all-Catholic hospital visiting with somebody. And there was some nuns walking across the courtyard. Brother Carl Hatch in his gruff voice said, Hey, sisters, how would y'all like to get saved, go straight to heaven, bypass purgatory, straight shot? But the Tony Hudson will tell you right now, both them nuns got saved. Amen? He said, I was embarrassed. I was hiding behind a bush because I didn't know what Brother Carl Hatch was going to say. That's what kind of man he was, but I sure appreciate him. I want to say tonight, I love the house of God because it's conducive to the praise of the sovereign tonight. I want to say tonight, I sure love the house of God tonight. I love what happens down at the house of God tonight because not only of the praise of the sovereign tonight, but I sure am thankful for the presence of the Savior every minute, every minute, amen. From the time the first note is keyed up on the piano, uh, And before the very first voice is opened up, I believe the presence of God begins to flood this place. Uh, Because the Bible says God inhabits the praises of His people uh, and the prayers of His people. Amen. Uh, Why do I love the house of God? Uh, It's because when I come here, uh, I can feel the very presence of a Savior, uh, of a Sovereign, uh, of a Lord tonight, uh, that this world is missing around us. Amen. I love it. Even when you feel down in the dumps, I sure am glad the Lord shows up. I sure am glad that whenever all of a sudden you come in dragging all of the world's weight, uh, that He's there to put His arm around you in the house of God in times of worship. I sure am glad that God shows up. Thank God for it. Hallelujah. When all of a sudden you see the Spirit of God moving from pew to pew uh, and the presence of God is so real and so thick and so manifested in this place uh, that you can't help but just know uh, that you're in the presence of the Most High God. Uh, Why do we love the habitation of the Lord's house? It's because the Lord is here. Amen. You know, tonight if the Lord was to stop meeting here, this place would be absolutely useless. I know of churches tonight that should have the word Ichabod written over the, uh, written over the door because the Spirit of God has departed from that place. As a matter of fact, I preached in a church one time. When I walked out, I actually said it out loud. I said, Ichabod's over this place. I mean, they couldn't, 
They wouldn't say amen to see an ant eat a bale of hay. They ain't seen nobody saved in years. They didn't have no desire to see God do anything. They just said, you know what? We're going to meet our requirement. We're going to be here. We're going to go to the house. We don't want God to do anything else. We don't want the presence of God. At 12 o'clock, we're walking out the door. If you don't like it, then you just have to get over it. We don't want God to take over the services. We don't want people testifying. We don't want sinners saved. That's the mentality of most folks today sitting upon the pews of our churches. They don't want God to do anything because it will cost them something. But Coleman, God ain't done nothing here yet. I don't think we're to that point yet. I think we've seen a glimpse of revival. But He ain't done nothing here yet. And I'm wondering why is it that, why is it that way? Why hasn't God just absolutely opened completely up to this church? I believe it's because some of us in here tonight has just seen it as being routine. I look across our congregation, and I'm not trying to be mean tonight. I'm just being honest with you tonight. Amen. I look across our congregation tonight, and half our people's out tonight. That saddens me. Why can't everybody that was here this morning be back here tonight? There's no reason why they couldn't. Now, I understand jobs, and I understand sickness. And listen, I'm, I understand all those things. But what about the ones that don't have anything going on? Where are they tonight? Oh, preacher, you shouldn't be pointing people out. Why? Y'all see they ain't here tonight. You want to know what's going on tonight? There's a routine thing going on in their lives. All they can see is just the very minute. All they can see is just fulfilling one little issue of their life. They don't want the power of God. They don't want the presence of God. They don't desire it, my friend. But my friend, I've got to have it, Sister Mary. I've got to be here. I, I need the presence of God. I, I can't go without the presence of God in my life. I, I need it every time the doors are open. Amen. Why did David say, I love the habitation of the Lord's house? It's because he said, I like it when God shows up. Thirdly tonight, and we'll be almost done, we'll have that business meeting. Thirdly tonight, what I see in our text tonight is this. The reason why David said, I love the habitation of the Lord's house, and I understand this tonight being New Testament, application tonight with an Old Testament scripture. He said, I like it when the Spirit is powerful in the service. Not only the Sovereign being praised and the Savior being present, but when the Spirit shows His power. I like it when the house of God, when the Spirit of God... You say, now hold on one second, preacher. Isn't that the same thing as the presence of the Lord? No. Not even close. I like it when the Spirit of God shows up. I like it when all of a sudden the sinner that's been sitting there under conviction all of a sudden finds themselves in a face-to-face -face conversation with a God having to make a decision over their soul salvation. Listen, my friend, I've seen people actually grip the pew so hard that their knuckles turn wide and be shaken under the conviction of the Holy Ghost of God. And you know and I know that God's dealing with them. And it's because the Spirit of God has shown up in His full power. I like it when things like that happen. I like it when all of a sudden that one raises her hand and says, Preacher, I just feel like I've got to give God the glory. A couple of Sundays ago, did we not see the Spirit of God show up in this place? By the way, that doesn't happen in an unhealthy church. But there's people that don't like those things. There's people that don't care for those things. There's people that think those things are superficial and sometimes fake. And 
Believe it or not, I can pretty much tell you when it's fake and when it's not. I've been around it too long. But I like it when it's real. I like it when all of a sudden God takes over and God's Spirit begins to move. I, and I've seen it. Hallelujah. Y'all don't get to see what I get to see sitting up on the platform. I, when all of a sudden God begins to sweep through this place, I can actually start seeing it just sweep across this place. You say, Preacher, you see the Spirit of God? No, I see the presence and I see the aspects of the Spirit of God. I start seeing people's eyes swell up in tears. I, I start seeing little old hands go up in praise. I, I start seeing people get nervous in their seat. I, I start seeing people get down between the pews I, and begin to plead on a holy God. I, I start seeing God do something. He begins to move I, and begins to minister and begins to weave in and out of the pews. I start seeing God do those things. I, and that's the reason why I love coming down to the house of God. I, because it makes things so real in my life I, that I can't help but say glory to God. I, hallelujah. I don't want to miss a second of it. Amen. Somebody told me not too long ago, they said, I knew when I missed church, I was going to miss one of the best services. Every time you miss church, you miss a good service. Whether there's a tear shed or a 